Okay, so hello everyone and thank you so much uh, for joining us today for collecting in the time of COVID with Roberta Cosi and Lucy McGarry, um, co-founders of Latitudes. And this event is co-hosted by Griffin Art Projects and the Contemporary Art Society of Vancouver. So I'm just going to share my screen again quickly here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the tsleil Squamish, and Stolo Nations, and we are honored and grateful to undertake our work here. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I would like to acknowledge we are honored to work on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. This recognition is a gesture of respect towards the Indigenous stewards of the land we occupy, whose rich cultures are fundamental to the artistic life in Vancouver and to our work in CSAV. And as we're gathered online today, um, I want to take this opportunity to invite everyone here to share the lands they're joining us from. So please share um, in the chat if you'd like. So I also wanted to mention that if you would like to see live captions displayed for today's presentation, you can enable this by selecting the CC live transcription button at the bottom of your screen. And I always do mention it's not perfectly accurate and in particular names tend to be a little bit trickier, uh, but we do hope that it will be helpful in capturing most of what we are saying today. I also wanted to mention that uh, if you do happen to run into any technical difficulties at all during today's presentation, um, we are also going to be live streaming today's event on Griffin's Facebook page. And I'm just going to go ahead and drop that link in the chat. So head over to Facebook if you're having any issues with Zoom and you will be able to um, catch the live event there as well. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And the only other thing I wanted to mention is that we are in webinar format today. And that just means that we cannot see or hear our participants. Um, but if you would like to get in touch with us, definitely feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, or if you have any technical issues or anything like that, um, go ahead and um, just get in touch with us using the chat. But I'll also mention that there will be time at the end of today's presentations for questions for Roberta and Lucy. So if you have any questions for our presenters specifically, um, feel free to type them in the Q&A dialog box, which is actually just separate from the chat. And we'll be getting to questions um, at the very end of the presentation. At that time, there'll also be the option of asking your question out loud. So if that's your preference, uh, it's always really lovely to hear from you directly. So feel free to either raise a virtual hand um, or to just indicate in the Q&A that you'd like to speak out loud. And we can go ahead and give you the option to unmute. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I'm joined here by Jazz Lally of the Contemporary Art Society of Vancouver, and we are co-hosting today's event. So Jazz and I thought it might be kind of a nice way to start just if we could both introduce um, the host organizations and share a few words um, about both Griffin and the Contemporary Art Society um, for those who might not be familiar with our organizations. So Griffin Art Projects is a nonprofit art residency and gallery located in North Vancouver, devoted to supporting artists in the production of new work through its residency program, and in creating new research on contemporary, contemporary Canadian and international art artists and art collections from around the world in its exhibition program. And Griffin Art Projects exhibitions and events are always free and open to all to attend. So today's program is offered in conjunction with Griffin's current exhibition, William Kentridge the Colander, on view at the gallery. Um, it just opened, so it's on view from May 29th till September 4th, and it is curated by Griffin's director, Lisa Baldessera. And so accompanying the exhibition is a series of international and Canadian online programs that explore the unique artistic perspectives and histories that exist in Canadian and South African experience as seen through the eyes of artists, writers, curators, and arts administrators. Uh, and today's event in particular is the first of a two-part mini-series co-hosted between Griffin and CASV that focuses on the impacts that COVID-19 has had on artists, galleries, curators, studios, and online entities operating within the complex ecosystem of the international art market in South Africa, Canada, and beyond. 
So I'll pass it over to you, Jazz. Thank you, Jazz. And to Griffin Art Project for letting CSAV collaborate um, on this mini series about collecting. I know we've done a few in the past as well. So it's actually going to be, it's really unique to hear how the world has changed during the COVID times. Um, so as Jess said, I'm the president of the Contemporary Art Society of Vancouver, um, and the society um, is a registered charitable organization founded in 1977, and we promote the understanding and appreciation of contemporary art by hosting a regular schedule of members-only events featuring local artists, curators, um, directors, and critics. So if you want to hear more or learn more about CSAV, head on to our webpage. Awesome. Thanks, Jess. Um, so we are absolutely delighted to present our speakers today. So I'm going to go ahead and add Roberta and Lucy to our spotlight. Um, and so Roberta Cosi is co-director of Latitudes Art Fair and Latitudes Online, a new online marketplace for contemporary art from Africa. She has over a decade's experience working in the cultural space in South Africa. She started her career in editorial writing for premium publications such as National Geographic, House and Leisure, and Sunday Times. After this, Roberta, went, uh, Roberta spent several years curating and producing large-scale events such as Handmade Contemporary Art Fair and the Winter Sculpture Fair before starting her own events and communications company, La Mano. In 2019, she proudly co-founded Latitude's Art Fair. And we also have Lucy McGarry joining us, who is a co-director of Latitudes Art Fair and Latitudes Online. In September 2019, McGarry launched Latitudes Art Fair at Sandin City. Prior to this, she um, held the following positions, director of Lucy McGarry Art Advisory, curator of the South African Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, curator of FNB Job, Job, Job so Joburg Art Fair, curator of Sphere, Nando's Holland Collection, um, and um, owner of La Mag Collections. In her curatorial endeavors, Magari follows an in inclusive approach to present contemporary African artists at the forefront of both national and international artistic debate. She holds a master's from Witwatersrand Rand University, Johannesburg, and an honors from UCT Commerce Department. Thank you, Lucy, for joining us today, and Roberta. And over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Jazz and Jazz. You guys have kept it very easy for us having the same names. <laughs> so just to clarify, I'm Roberta and this is Lucy. And um, you guys have done such a beautiful job introducing us. Thank you. So we won't we won't spend any more time <laughs> chatting about us unless you want to no. mention anything. Thank you so much for having us. And this is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you for Griffin Project. Um, we followed Griffin for a while and we'll talk a little bit later about how we came about with this collaboration and how we came to connect with Griffin our projects in a kind of a, in a more um, in a more serious way. So we yeah. have um, prepared a presentation which Roberta will tell you about. Yeah, so we we are actually in Johannesburg in South Africa. Johannesburg is the biggest city in South Africa in case you guys aren't aware of it. And um, yeah, today, as mentioned by Jazz, we're going to be talking about the challenges and the opportunities brought about by COVID, particularly in an African context. And unfortunately, an African context often brings with it um, technological issues. One of these is that for the last few years, we've been experiencing what is um, very optimistically called load shedding. And that is where the government switch, simply switches off your electricity <laughs> when, the, when the capacity gets too high. So we aren't scheduled to have any load shedding this evening, but to be safe, we thought we would pre-record um, the first part of our presentation. So um, Jazz is going to play that now, and we will catch up with you afterwards for more of a live um, conversational chat. So we'll see you guys shortly. Thank you. We are excited today to present our take on collecting in the time of COVID. Once again, I'm Lucy McGarry and my colleague Roberta Kochi and I will be chatting to you today. Thank you so much to Griffin Art Projects for allowing us to share our experiences over the past year. So Latitudes was founded in 2019 as a physical art fair. At the time, we saw a gap in the market for a more inclusive fair one that would break down the inequalities of the art industry and allow galleries, studios, curators, artists, and nonprofit organizations to sell art side by side. As you may know, traditional art fairs um, have a number of stringent participation rules 
galleries have to, for example, have had to have space, have had to have a physical space and to have been around for a number of years and so on. So after much deliberation, our team of five founding women questioned this ethos and asked ourselves why we couldn't build an art fair that was more inclusive. The first edition took place on the iconic Nelson Mandela Square in Johannesburg, and we had exhibitors fly in from as far afield as Oslo, New York, and of course, across the African continent. Given the success of our 2019 edition, we planned on scaling up immensely in 2020, moving to the rooftop of Santon City, Johannesburg, uh, the city's most established commercial center. But obviously COVID had other ideas for us. And by March, 2020, we knew we had to make another plan. I must say that we acted extremely quickly, transforming our physical fair into an online platform. Latitudes Online takes the same lateral approach um, to selling art as our fair did. And we launched in July 2020 with over 150 exhibitors, um, our, rather our platform in 2020. Among the exhibitors was a balanced mix of galleries, independent artists, curators, studios, and non-profit organizations again. The platform has really uh, performed beyond our expectations. We've been viewed in 134 of 195 countries and have now over 550 artists on the site. And over the past few months, we have been shipping works across Africa and the world. I think that we can safely say that we launched at a very timeless moment in the art industry. The market for modern and contemporary African art has really grown steadily over the last few years, a fact that is obvious when looking at the success of events as um, fairs such as 154 in London. So just as lockdown was coming into play around the world, Sotheby's Modern and Contemporary African Art Sale opened online in March last year. The auction brought in 2.9 million US dollars, setting new auction records for five artists such as Cameroonian photographer Samuel Fosso, Mozambique, um, Mozambican painter Bertina Lopez, Zimbabwean painter Richard, um, Richard Mudariki, Tanzanian painter Ilias Jengo, and Nigerian painter Shina Yusuf. While these are high ticket items in general, factors such as affordable prices, value, and commercial agility of the African art market have undoubtedly helped. And when it comes to art from Africa, the access price point is much lower than most other regions, which means we are in a strong position to be more accessible online. What's more, African dealers and galleries are quite accustomed to operating online internationally, being sort of geographically isolated, and have always had a collaborative, adaptive spirit. So thanks to these points, the market is surviving and the, pan uh, the pandemic very well for now. A great example of an adaptive spirit is the Six for Six initiative launched in March 2020 by Ayo Adimika, the owner and director of Taffeta, a London gallery specializing in modern and contemporary African art. The premise is simple. The gallery sends up to three artworks at a time to a prospective collector who can then live with these works for up to six weeks. He or the, um, if he or she decides then to buy, payment can be arranged in a series of six installment plans. Hence, six by six. So an orthodox offering, just such as these, you know, have, have become much more common since lockdown and seem to be paying off. And despite forward thinking initiatives such as these, collectors have really had no other option but to go online to buy art. Which is why, coupled with a uh, growing interest in art from Africa, the launch of Latitudes was so timeless. Consuming art has traditionally been a visual activity that uses sight and sometimes touch at galleries, museums, or even private showings. But over a year after the outbreak, people are increasingly enjoying the comfort of it and safety of their own homes and using computers to browse and bid on artworks. That's not to say that the industry is booming, unfortunately. In fact, it shrank by 22% in 2020, down from 64 billion US dollars in sales to 29, in 2019 to 50 um, billion last year. But if we look at the numbers more closely, we can see an exciting nod to the art market's digital pivot. Online sales 
value doubled from 6 billion in 2019 to 12.4 billion in 2020. Very exciting. They also more than doubled as a share of all sales by value, going from accounting for 9% of the overall art market in 2019 to a full quarter of all sales by value in 2020. So this is incredibly exciting for all of us. And um, it now brings me to introduce my colleague, Roberta, who will continue. Thanks, Lucy, and hi, everyone. So what, what does it mean that the art industry has made such a big shift towards selling online? Well, while you know, we're all very excited about it, there are, of course, challenges. For one, many artworks fail to sell successfully online. You know, obviously, the medium is important here, and it's very hard to sell you know, installation works and sculptures, with, which you can't really get a grasp of through a screen. And also, it's, only, it's often artworks at the very top end of the market, representing well-established artists with perceived unique value that sell consistently. And some of these have actually been achieving record prices in the last year. For example, from a South African context, Irma Stern, an artist who achieved national and international and international recognition in her lifetime, has a massive online following. And the same goes for Gerard Sokoto, Maggie Laubscher, and Sydney Kamalo. All these artists' works have been selling um, very well online. But that said, um, there's something we're very excited about is that conversely, and this is probably a price point issue, is that works by emerging artists have been selling well online. And research shows that across the board, no matter what industry you're working in, people seem, or consumers seem to be comfortable spending about $2,000 online. And that for us has proved to be the case, which is why emerging art seems to be doing well online. On the whole, with Latitudes, we found that the greatest advantage to selling online has been access to new buyers. Although globally, the total value of sales over the past 10 to 12 months has been down, there has been an exceptional growth in new buyers. Over the past few months at Latitudes, we've been playing around with this and experimented, exper experimented with new and accessible platforms. So what we've done is we've tried things like Instagram auctions that worked very, very well for us and attracted many new buyers. And we've also developed a, an auction plugin onto our website. And we found that people were curious about that too. And um, every, time, every time we do this, we seem to attract new buyers, which has been great. And we try to get in touch with them to see what drew them to buying art for the first time. And their feedback's been very interesting. They say that often they're too intimidated to walk into a gallery or to an auction house. And also the fact that they can buy online from the comfort of their own home. And importantly, that they can see the prices and the information without having to ask for it has drawn them to buy. And also the fact that they, you know, they're all very familiar with um, technology such as Instagram, platforms such as Instagram or, or um, e-commerce. So that's made it a lot more accessible to them. And we're hoping that when the world opens up again after lockdown, the confident ga confidence gained by these new collectors will lead them to enter the more traditional art market and get them to walk into and buy from galleries and auction houses. And when it comes to selling online, this is a very well-known fact, but we've really seen it firsthand over the last year, is the impact of content. Research shows that consumers need to see something five times online before they register it. So um, it's important to us to carry on creating content con constantly and putting it across our different platforms, whether it's on the website, in a newsletter, on social media. It seems that you can't, re you can't repeat yourself often enough. And, um, you know, this leads back to the fact that one of the big reasons people are buying online is accessibility. So with the content you create, collectors can search for the works they're after. They can also buy from international art fairs without having to physically be there, which is great. And also, platforms like Latitudes are introducing collectors around the world to artists and galleries they may not previously have had access to, which once again is why content is so important. A large part of our business, in fact, um, has been creating content around artists and their works allowing collectors to get to know them on a more personal level and sharing behind the scenes shots of how they work. And once again, research shows that collectors feel that the access to information about art artists that online platforms provide 
creates a strong incentive to purchase through these channels. Also, that compared to ARC fairs, where a collector might have that same information, but be expected to make a decision on the spot, online platforms allow collectors to feel like they have the time to do their research at their own pace, without the pressure of a salesperson hovering over them waiting for an answer. So one of the um, fun things since we launched is that um, at Latitudes, we've also been working as an artist agency. And this came about because we were working with independent artists and realized that a lot of them actually needed some guidance in their early career. One artist we've worked very successfully with is Cynthia Sifa Mulanga. She's in her early 20s and she was a student when she joined Latitudes as an independent artist last year. We fell in love with her work and we really pushed it online, featuring interviews with her, we set up Insta Live talks, and we pushed her work in many different ways. And the strategy seems to have worked because her first body of work sold out within two weeks of launching the site and proving that content, obviously, um, along with great art, really sells. Since then, we've worked very closely with Cynthia, fostering relationships for her with international dealers and, art and galleries. And over the past few months, she's shown at London Art Fair and has art, and at, at Art Brussels and has participated in numerous group shows around the world all without having to leave Johannesburg, which has just been so great for her. And exciting news when it comes to Cynthia is that we're actually currently working on her first print edition with Canadian printmaker Gillian Ross. So we'll keep you posted on when that is released. And Cynthia, as an example, shows how platforms like Latitudes can really help to, to disrupt the traditional art fair model and the way things are done. A young, successful artists like this would traditionally be snapped up and tied down by a gallery, but we're offering her the opportunity to sell her own work online, to be her own agent, and to create many relationships around the world, giving her the experience and knowledge to make informed decisions about her career. Working with independent artists in this way has given us insight into the gaps that are missing in their practice and education. And as such, we've recently launched a new division of Latitudes, one that we're very excited about, and this is Latitudes Education. We kicked off with two programs last month, Artist Lab and Curator Lab. Artist Lab is a professional practice skills development program for artists that are looking to build a career in the industry. We ran it as a five session intensive seminar program, and I must mention that it was free as well, um, which trained participating artists in some of the key skills needed to build a strong foundation for a career in the arts. So this could be things like how to make invoices, how to market yourself, and um, professional etiquette and things like that. And at the same time, while learning these business skills, artists also developed work under the supervision of three established artists. And these works will, be, um, will go towards an online group exhibition, which will be hosted on Latitudes next month. So not only were the artists trained in turning their practice into a sustainable business, but they've also been given the opportunity to sell online. Our second program that I mentioned is Curator Lab, and that takes the format of a facilitated online residency. Um, it is designed to offer practical experience in the industry and to hone the curatorial skills of young curators. As one of the few programs offered for curators in South Africa, it allows for participating candidates to plan and conceptualize their own show to be hosted online and on our platform. And we obviously work very closely with them, mentoring them along the way in the process of curating a show and implementing it. And for this program, it was really important for us to identify curators outside the hubs of Johannesburg and Cape Town. And we managed to find curators in all nine provinces of South Africa, which is really exciting to us because you know, from their perspective, they don't necessarily have that many um, opportunities such as this. They, these opportunities usually exist in the main cities. And, but also from our side, it provided us with access at grassroots level to artists throughout the country that we may not otherwise have identified and that were brought to us through these curators' networks. So these, uh, the nine curators' shows will launch next month on Latitudes. And the program has been so successful that we are actually looking to roll it out in other countries across the continent. So I think what's been really apparent to us in the shift to online over the past year is how quickly things can happen and change. 
Before, if we had an idea, we would have had to wait until our annual fair in September to make it happen. Now we can literally put an idea together, phone our de developers and make it happen within, within a matter of days. I mean, as we've mentioned um, over this presentation, in just a few months, we've launched an online marketplace for Art from Africa. We've created an editorial division. We've developed an auction facility, initiated an artist agency, and now we've created an educational program. And every day, we're in meetings with museum directors, gallerists, dealers, and so on around the world, and creating partnerships that just a year ago would have been very unlikely. And this collaboration, collaborative nature of working online has been incredible for us and really invaluable to our business as well as to our ethos, because our mission has always been to make collecting inclusive for everybody. And now the internet really is allowing us to do so. Thank you so much. And we will be joining you live in just a minute. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Roberta and Lucy. I just, it's incredible to hear the journey you've been on with Latitudes and just how quickly you made that shift in response to lockdown and COVID-19 and were able to transform Latitudes as a physical art fair into this huge online entity that just, you know, has so much positive impact in so many different dimensions for artists and gallerists and collectors, as well as you know, being an educational um, institution and having an educational mandate as well is just really incredible. So thank you so much for sharing that amazing story. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, it was actually it was quite a fun exercise actually thinking about it and uh, you know we we move so fast sometimes all of us in the world you know that you don't stop and look back at what you've done so it was actually a really rewarding exercise so thank you <laughs> yeah no that's amazing and just such a silver lining too the past year of course has just been so challenging and devastating in so many ways so it's just really um wonderful to hear such a success story and and how many um you know how much silver linings were brought through with moving it online and all the positives that were able to, you know, come through. So yeah, just really inspirational to see. Thanks again uh, for sharing. And so we thought for this next portion of the program, uh, we would kind of transition more into a live, more informal conversation. Um, and we thought a really nice way to kick off the conversation might be to actually just turn back to ask you to elaborate a little bit on um, some of the collaborative works uh, you or the collaborative initiative you have planned with uh, master printmaker Jillian Ross. And for those of you in the audience um, who don't know Jillian, Griffin has actually been working really closely um, with Jillian. So Griffin's director, Lisa Balasera, um, in her in curating our current exhibition, William Kentridge the Colander, Lisa has worked very closely with Jillian um, to coordinate the exhibition. And actually Jillian Ross was in residence at Griffin um, earlier in the year, actually working on putting together one of the major prints that's in the exhibition. Um, so yeah, really great um, connection that you're able to uh, kind of talk a little bit about the work you have going on with Jillian Ross. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, Gillian Ross lived in South Africa and, and worked um, at one of the big printmaking studios in South Africa, David Crook Project, for 15 years. And we have worked, I also worked with Gillian at David Crook for five years. Um, and so we know each other both professionally and, and we're very close friends. And, uh, you know, through Gillian having moved now recently to Vancouver, or rather to, to Canada, to Saskatchewan, and now is working with Griffin Projects. This is how we actually got kind of introduced to Griffin and Griffin Art Projects on a, on a sort of more serious level. I'd actually the sorry in Venice at the 27 Venice Biennale and we connect there over um, over projects that she was initiating in Canada and it's and it's so wonderful for us because I think you know Canada and South Africa also kind of uh, share a sort of um, a history which you know in terms of um, you know a, uh, colonial history and uh, we connected over those kinds of exhibitions curatorially and so now we're so proud that Jill um, has been 
given this opportunity to put together a sort of a retrospective exhibition of prints by William Kentridge in, in Vancouver. And so we're very, you know, thrilled to be connected to that. So thank you, yeah, <laughs> for allowing us to explain the connection and how that's come about. And I think for me, I must say that it's really proven the, I'm not sure why it took COVID to make us realize that you can collaborate cross-continentally. It's so crazy, you know, we've had these platforms like, Skype and WhatsApp video calls and that for so long, but we never used them. Why do we? And certainly didn't. And now, you know, just last week, um, well, maybe we should go back and say what the project is, is that we're going to be working with Jill um, to create prints of emerging South African artists in Canada. And um, Lucy can maybe talk more about the technical side of it and the techniques. But just last week, Jill shipped a beautiful package to us filled with tools that the artists can use to create the um, the prints and we phoned her on a video call unwrapped this gorgeous patch package that she made together and she talked us through the different techniques and then we'll go back to the artists and then together with Jill we'll you know uh, guide them on how to use them but it's just amazing that it's another highlight of that COVID's taught us that we can work in these new ways and I'm not sure why we never did it before yeah so we, we're super excited for that and um, hopefully those prints will be um, we'll be working on them in the next month over June. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely we would never have thought about kind of, you know, making a print project so far away from one another and COVID has just allowed us all to kind of have to break down all of those barriers and to just see how easy it is and how fortunate we are with kind of international shipping and and being online and it's actually quite seamless as a process and now we can all kind of learn from each other and and leverage off mm. each other each other's kind of um you know so for example you know you have sort of experience and connections within that industry in, in your country and vice versa you know we have incredible access to so many artists of diversity and skill and then we marry those and you know wonderful things can happen so hmm. that's an exciting project and a perfect example of a kind of COVID silver lining. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Um, and I'll just do a little plug here as well, because actually part two of this mini series collecting in the time of COVID will actually have Jill in conversation um, with Vivian Meyer of Vivian Art in Calgary, a contemporary Canadian art gallery, um, as well as Amy Bell, who is actually the gallery manager at David Crute Project. So yeah, another neat connection there. And we do invite you to Great. join us. Um, for that second mini session. Um, so I'll just mention again here, if anyone in the audience is starting to have questions or maybe thoughts thrown through your mind, feel free at any point to type those in the Q&A um, and uh, we can get to those shortly. I know Jazz Lally and I also had some questions up our sleeves if, um, to get us started there as well. Um, but yeah, definitely feel free at any time to just type your questions in the Q&A dialogue box, which again is actually just separate from the chat. Um, so I don't know, Jazz, if you want to join us here too, I'll just add you here to our spotlight. Awesome. Yeah, I think there is a question um, in the chat already. Oh, amazing. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have a question from Steve, who writes, how do you think the current online environment and post-COVID environment will impact the critical international art platforms like the Venice Biennale and Documenta? How have your views changed of these events? So I think, um, I'll jump in here. I think that um, having worked um, not with, with this, um, and also we both work at a company which ran our, our local fairs, a design fair which Roberta ran and myself, Johannesburg Art Fair. Um, and the, these events are such crucial events for the art community. And I think that they do provide an incredibly you know, vital role in, 
and sort of, you know, provincially for our, our cities. And, you know, we're quite remote down here in South Africa. So, you know, we all come together at a particular kind of time of year in September where the whole art community gets together. And I don't think that one can ever replace those kind, that kind of <clears throat> momentum and the networks that are formed in those situations and, and the personal connections. Um, and the same thing goes for Venice. It's, an, um, it's such an incredible opportunity, you know, you know, every second year to come together as an art community. But I do think that what we've learned is how to really harness um, the power of, of online and kind of, I think it will only complement these events going forward. So now that we have and we understand this, we can actually set up our time more proactively and actually get more out of these events that when we actually are there in person, you know, we've, we've lined up conversations, talks and engagements in a much more kind of structured way. And I feel like there's even things that can you can take out of the event post the event because we've all learned so much about how to be online and how to mm -hmm. how to activate and and leverage that tool it's a tool and and we all know and we're all adept now absolutely and i i think that um we'll see a much bigger move towards hybrid events as well i think once again i'm not sure why we didn't do it before there'll be always be an online element to all large events going forward which can only be good for the industry because you can reach a much 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 broader audience and you know not everyone can tra travel you know whether it's you know financial implications or just the time involved in doing so it's not always convenient for people so i think you know as we alluded to in the presentation i think hopefully we're also um more and more people are are being introduced to the art world, new audiences. And hopefully once we move into back into the physical realm of events, this will and um, these people will be attracted to these events and it can only help the industry grow. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love this idea of kind of taking on a more hybrid approach in the future because I do think, yeah, even this very event that's happening right now is just kind of a perfect example of how you're able to just completely break down those geographic barriers through online events like this and just reach that much wider of an audience and bring people together that are, you know, geographically so far apart. Um, so yeah. But the great thing is, you know, we all do miss human interaction. Live events are never going to go away. You know, the yeah. people who, who, who question that, but they, they won't. There's nothing better than being in a room with people and networking on a very personal level. Yeah, and I, I, I think also of in your presentation, um, I think it was Roberta that mentioned how, you know, two dimensional works, paintings, drawings, prints translate much more easily online than installations and sculptural works. And I wonder kind of, um, yeah, if you found any ways to approach kind of bring those more two dimensional or works that don't translate as easily to an online format or if you've kind of how you've navigated those types of challenges. So it's interesting you've asked that because we mentioned one of our programs, our educational programs that we're working on currently is the Artist Lab. And it's a five week program. And actually yesterday was the final session and all the artists had to present their works. And a lot of, actually I'd say the majority of them are um, three dimensional works. Mm -hmm. So the curator of the show, um, who's actually on the Latitudes team, she, her focus for the show is exactly that, is how do you present works online, you know, with, you know, lacking a physical space. And it's been very interesting. That's going to be the next three weeks we're going to be exploring that very in depth. So I don't think we have all the answers yet, mm -hmm. but technology is phenomenal now. You know, you can just, you can scan, 3D scan items. You, I mean, if you, if you really want to get very in depth into it, you can create virtual worlds where you can walk around, you almost feel like you're touching the sculptures, you can walk around them. There's technology that can allow you to climb over a sculpture. It's, wow. it's, it's really phenomenal. So we, we're looking into all of that now. It's, um, it's a whole new world. It's all very, very exciting. But then I think also sometimes, you know, like Lucy made a good point when we were meeting with the curator, you know, we were talking about creating 3D galleries and saying, well, maybe we should be thinking differently about it because we are online. It's not a gallery space. So mm -hmm. why are we trying to recreate a gallery space? So these are all open questions that we haven't answered yet, but it's, it's very fun to think around these points. I think it's just because, you know, we've all gone through this being in the art world and we're quite lucky to have been in an industry which is so visually oriented, you know, um, as opposed to others, which are event based, for example. 
um, you know, the art, the art world has fared very well over COVID, um, you know, globally, because it is so visual. And um, we've kind of all, if we're very closely involved, witnessed how people have, um, you know, tried their, their hardest to, to kind of weather the storm. And so, for example, I think the first one was, you know, uh, Freeze and then, you know, Basel and all the online viewing rooms. And we were able to kind of witness how all these major kind of international fairs and events handled these things. And um, I think just in engaging with art online, I think you know, there were lots of attempts to create these kind of 3D experiences and all of those kinds of things. Whereas sometimes it's actually some, somewhat frustrating because, you know, you're kind of engaging with technology and you like find yourself like walking forward and bumping into a blank wall <laughs> and not knowing how to move left or right. And then at a point you think like, well, look, where are the lines and kind of where does technology, you know, serve and where does it not? And, maybe this kind of 3D experience is best in the in real in the real and you know it's also we're all finding our ways and we're we're learning what this new language is and and sometimes oftentimes some of that technology can just feel gimmicky and kind of mm. a little bit flat so it's also about kind of now looking back now that we've had these experiences and kind of what actually works and what isn't frustrating to the person who's used to being online and, and being you know very fast at navigating and in that space um so yeah so it's we're just kind of moving through it and all learning together really yeah yeah, yeah. amazing um so we have a question oh sorry jazz oh, no, uh, question yeah okay but I I, I was we just have a question very relevant that's come in the chat so i'll just read it out loud here um, as buyers are buying art online, have you had any feedback that buyers feel a disparity between how artworks look online versus when the works actually arrive at their house after they've bought it? Like when you buy clothing online and it looks nothing like it when the item arrives. <laughs> so firstly, I'd like to say Leanne Niehaus is one of our very good friends, another South African um, Canadian connection. Um, she has moved to Canada and she is also in the art world and we're also collaborating with her. So hi Lee. Hello. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Thank you. So I, I think the great thing about art is that it doesn't necessarily have to fit. So we haven't had those those um, difficulties, luckily. And we are we try and um, contact most of our buyers to see when um, once the artworks arrived, just to check that it arrived in good condition and they're happy with it. And funny enough, I was there was something I was very, very nervous about because this was very new to us. You know, we had always worked in art fairs or, you know, we weren't actually in a gallery space where we handled and shipped art. So it was very new to us and I was quite nervous about that. But we haven't had, we actually touch wood, haven't had anyone complain or want to return works. We have had um, actually one guy absolutely loved a work. He was based in, I think he's in Germany loved to work and um but then he we we got him to use this art place uh, um software that actually can place it in your house and he said yeah he loves it but it's way too big for my space so there is technology that can help um uh, you know avoid those problems and then for him we ended up working with the artist to custom make a piece at the right scale for him and which was actually ended up being vastly different to the one that he originally looked at and that ended up really well yeah. so i think there are there, there are ways to use technology to circumvent those issues yeah and we we just found um buyers to be actually incredibly generous and sort of uh you know open to this experience of buying online it's amazing how people have really kind of you know I don't know, taken it on. And also, mm -hmm. conversely, what's been quite interesting for us is we were, you know, uh, one of the first platforms to actually engage with independent artists as opposed to working through galleries. And, and this is also something that was a major concern for us was the fact that um, a lot of the art platforms out there, the major international art platforms, um, marketplaces, which are, you know, platforms where people people come together to sell art from traditionally galleries. And, and the reason for that is that the, the platform can have sort of full knowledge that the work will be, you know, shipped and packaged correctly and shipped in a way that's professional and then lands in the hands of the collector and is perfect. 
and 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 we were one of our kind of core tenants was to open up the market and to sort of allow it to be more democratic and in doing so to have independent artists be part of this and we have been so so pleasantly surprised actually at as to how professional artists are you know and and some artists in south africa do not have studios and do not have beautiful spaces to work out of but their kind of level level of professionalism has been astounding to us and um we have created depots in in both um, our local cities johannesburg and cape town where we receive works and and check works and pack works and send them off but the works that we receive are so beautifully kind of handled generally um by and large so mm -hmm. That's also been a huge learning curve for us that, you know, artists are, you know, part of the ecosystem in that way. So that's also been great. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. I was just going to ask, um, in your presentation, you mentioned there's like the new collectors um, that have been increasing and in buyers. Can you speak a little bit about possibly who the new collectors are? Are they a younger generation? Or perhaps more used to being online and more comfortable? Um, are there like seasonal buyers who are returning? So we've definitely had both of those, but the, the exciting part for us has been the young collectors. And as you mentioned in the presentation, it's particularly when we um, experiment with new platforms for buying. So at the Instagram auction, which I mentioned, I think that about 80% of the people who bought off that auction were first time buyers which was remarkable to us and they all said the same thing it's like you know it's that difference of actually walking into an auction space which which shouldn't be intimidating i must say i i used to be a journalist and i was invited as a journalist to one of the big auction houses to a media event where where they did a mock auction and they showed us how it actually isn't intimidating but for someone like me who had never been to one before it's not something i ever would have done it, it does feel like a very scary space to walk into so for this it's just someone scrolling along instagram and oh i can write my bid in a comment you know there's nothing out of the ordinary about that so that's been really exciting and it um I mean, I remember the one was a, the one lady was a surgeon, very young, early 30s, so, uh, newly qualified as a surgeon. So, you know, not people from the art world at all. And um, a lot of the people who buy from us have just moved into um, their first homes. So they're looking to buy art for the first time. And, and yeah, the same thing. They just, it's also they, what, what they like is that they can go to one place where they're getting a whole range of art that's not being pushed by one source mm. so they feel like they may, they're making their own independent choice so you know that they're not having a salesperson hover over them trying to put them into it mm. yeah and also what what this platform has allowed us to do is to access internal buyers so um we are incredibly lucky in the sense that we well not incredibly lucky but the rand is is actually quite weak our to, for example, the euro, but it actually works in our favor in the sense that the work is so much more affordable to mm. an international buyer. So we've we've really benefited from that um, in shipping works around the world, largely to the, uh, the United States um, and in Europe. So yeah, mm. yeah, and, and it's not a high risk purchase at that price, you know. So. When you convert it, um, it actually works out, and so and and in that respect, we've actually got many um, buyers coming back. So once mm. we've shipped works to them, then you know there's kind of a relationship that's been formed, and that's been really rewarding for us. Mm. And and one of the things that we do is traditionally, you know, galleries, you know, have the kind of the sale relationship with the collector. But what Latitudes likes to do is actually introduce the collector and the artist or the collector and the gallerist. And that that kind of transparency is important for us. And we're finding that that transparency is really being enjoyed by the collectors and the artists, because the artists then get to, you know, have a record and an archive of where their work has gone. Um, and collectors more and more are enjoying that kind of direct engagement with the artists. And, and we find that they you know, they go on to form their own kind of independent relationships. And that's not something we want to be protective about. It's it's the nature of the platform that it should just grow organically and keep growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And again, such fascinating feedback, both 
Roberta, what you were saying about people not necessarily wanting to feel like they have, you know, a salesperson hovering over them and that they can just see that price right there online, um, as well as Lucy, what you were saying about collectors having that kind of like background info and access to like getting to know the artist through like what it's like to be in their studio and how they work and really who they are. And I wonder if thinking about a future where there's this hybrid of both online initiatives and in-person initiatives, if this kind of feedback will kind of also change how you approach future in-person events once those are possible again, just thinking about um, bringing those things, um, th those kind of feedback and, and suggestions into the, the in-person space. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. And I think the great thing about working in the online space is you just have such rich data as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can see exactly where the interest is coming from for which artists. And then, you know, who knows, maybe one day when the world opens up, we can come do an event in Vancouver mm -hmm. and we'll know which artists are popular in <laughs> Vancouver. So, you know, it's not just shooting from the hip and hoping for the best which is wonderful yeah yeah amazing and I had actually a question kind of in follow-up to jazz's but in the other direction I wondered if the shift online if you've had any feedback from collectors who may not be so comfortable with technology or kind of the fast pace of the online world and if kind of this shift has isolated a certain percentage of collectors who just you know might not be uncomfortable engaging with the technology I think um, I think that it's for me. I've kind of experienced that more on the kind of the seller side. So we've seen a lot of galleries and artists actually be left out of the conversation because they're not kind of they they didn't sort of pivot quickly enough or kind of get online and have a presence because they were kind of much more reliant on the physical interaction. Um, and and so that's kind of been easier for us to sort of quantify. Um, but but because we're so focused on the online, you know, we're we're engaging with people who kind of are online, and mm. we will, you know, we have plans to have a lot of kind of um, events, post, you know, as soon as we can, and as soon as things open up, um, mm. we we hope to to have mm. events again, yeah, smaller events that will not necessarily require like thousands of people and and yeah, COVID restricted events. I must say, I have noticed recently, like in the last two months, people emailing us asking, when is your next event going mm -hmm. to be? And a couple of people who maybe don't really understand the model asking, where's your gallery? We'd love to come in and look. Yes. So mm -hmm. I think maybe now that people are, the world is opening up, people are looking for that physical interaction again. But no, generally, maybe we just don't know about those people because they're not interacting with us. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the, yeah. Yeah. the corollary of it. But I think... Um, Generally, it's been very well received, and um, yeah, we've we've been pleasant actually as to how quickly the the model has changed, the industry has changed. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, so I know we are getting near the end of the hour, and I just want to make sure if any audience members have any questions that we get those in. So again, feel free to either raise a virtual hand, and I can unmute you, or um, go ahead and type your question, and we'll read it out loud. Um, yeah, I know I have some more questions in my back pocket, but I just want to make sure if there's anyone in the audience that <laughs> wants to get a question in, do feel free to jump right in. But I must say, while we're waiting, that I, it's just been so phenomenal for us as moving into the more educational space. You know, it's not mm -hmm. somewhere that we, when we started this business, we saw ourselves moving towards, but it's been incredibly rewarding. And, um, you know, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that it's it's really becoming one of the most interesting elements of the business to us and yeah just working with the young talent around the country it's it's just been a phenomenally rewarding experience yeah i don't think it's something we necessarily planned going mm. into uh the, launching the platform but it's like sometimes your business guides you and it, it really has in this respect and for example um the curator lag program we we made a point of connecting or bringing a curator on from every single province in South Africa. And all of these young, um, you know, curators are so incredibly articulate and so online and, you know, and all have kind of online profiles and are so sure about their sort of curatorial um, focuses and, 
and it was it's been an incredible experience in that respect but we have also identified gaps in in their kind of knowledge in the art world and that's also been important for us because i think if we want to continue to to work in this way we have to find a way to close those gaps and to provide mm. people with that kind of information and education so we have decided to make you know to launch these programs but then to make the edu the, the resources freely available for people to download because that's what we you know we have that we have that tool so we may as well make that kind of mm -hmm. accessible to people and and that just benefits everyone and so like Roberta mentioned you know in in the discussion like it's practical things mm -hmm. um you know how do you kind of just professionalize your art practice and but but being online and, and the youth of today is something, I mean, we, we feel like we're kind of like of an older generation and we're like <laughs> astounded at like the level yeah. of, of skill. And it's it's been amazing um, in that sense. And and that's why working with this kind of younger group of people, you know, they're, they're teaching us things and allowing us to see kind of where yeah. we need to grow the platform. Exactly. Yeah. And we've just seen the power of mentorship. So that's something we really want to work on going forward. So we actually have a whole program lined up. We just need to find ways to actually make it happen. But we, um, so with the young artists that we work with, like Cynthia that we mentioned, Puleng Mongale is a couple of artists we're working with. We want to guide them through a one-year program. And then once, once they've completed that, they will then become the mentors for the younger artists. And, you know, it's such an organic process, but that's, it's really lacking. I'm not sure about in Canada, but in South Africa, it really is lacking and there's so much value in it. And, um, you know, we also want to start things like monthly virtual peer mentorship sessions with our artists and curators and I just think the value of learning from other people in the industry is it's invaluable so we're hoping to get that off the ground soon yeah amazing no that's just incredible the kind of education and mentorship opportunities mm -hmm. that you're able to facilitate um, and too in your presentation um, when you mentioned that emerging artists their work actually sells quite well in an online context um, just like what an amazing platform to be able to be introducing emerging collectors to emerging artists and you know emerging curators just all yeah, part of the I mean, ecosystem yeah. galleries around the world as well you know like doing those introductions for young artists to galleries as you know in athens and brussels and all kinds of places and i think that's that's been amazing for the young artists mm -hmm. that have that have felt slightly isolated and intimidated by the whole experience and i think especially in a south african context you know we, we're not by any means trying to be in a formal educational platform we're just trying to guide and help where we can but you know in south african context where education is so lacking so often it's um these kind of programs are important and we, we're excited to see it grow yeah amazing <laughs> so maybe a last a last prompt to the audience if you have any questions uh jump right in and we'll get to them and um yeah, uh, Roberta and Lucy, do you, um, is there a way for our audience members to learn more and connect? Could, do you have a, or I, I do know you have a newsletter that people can sign up for. Um, so we would like to invite everyone to sign up to Latitude's newsletter and maybe even post um, talk, I could just share that link with um, our audience members today. Thank you. Yeah, so our, our URL is latitudes.online. It's the same for Instagram, for Facebook, and our actual website. And then on the at the bottom of our website, there is a newsletter sign up form. So if you just pop your email address in there, you will be signed up and we will be sending you lots of content. <laughs> As we said, we love content. Yeah, and we love collaborations. Like mm. we really do just love to connect with people um you know and our focus is africa like we are in the business of promoting african voices and african talent but if there's a kind of can it, there can be sort of any kind of circuitous connection um if you know it's it's even the content necessarily doesn't have to be south african as long as kind of um we're about promoting emerging talent so we really do encourage any kinds of collaboration so please do reach out to us because mm. um yeah mm. Amazing. As you said, it's so exciting to be able to have these cross-continental chats. So we would love to engage with um, with anyone who's watching later. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, amazing. So I'd like to just take the opportunity again um, on behalf of Griffin and the Contemporary Art Society of Vancouver. Just thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation and conversation. It's been so nice chatting with you both and learning more about the amazing history um, of latitudes and how it's kind of grown and thrived into this just amazing platform. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Jazz thank you, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful okay. I look yeah. forward to seeing all that you're doing in your newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. We look forward to connecting going forward. Wonderful. And thank you to everyone who joined us here today and wishing everyone a wonderful rest of their Sunday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.